on balance, when you're in the hospital, we tend to do things or offer things. So (laughs) you're more likely to have things happen when you're in the hospital. Now, a lot of that depends on the hospital and the culture of the hospital. But in general, like, stay home as long as you can, because once you get to the hospital, there's going to be more temptation for interventions. That's OBGYN Dr. Nicole Calloway-Rankins talking about one way to minimize the cascade of interventions, which is the idea that an initial intervention during labor can create the need or desire for another intervention. And as these interventions snowball or cascade from one to another, they may create problems and narrow your options or increase the risk of having a cesarean birth. Most interventions impact your birth hormones, and some may improve one aspect of labor, while at the same time creating opportunities for infections or having undesirable effects on baby. They may even make it harder to push your baby out. So Nicole and I will be talking about some of the most common medical procedures that can be part of a cascade of interventions. I'm Adriana Lozada, and you're listening to Birthful, here to inform your intuition. Hi, Nicole. It's so great to finally have you here on the show. And before we get to it, why don't you tell us a little bit about Uh yourself and how you identify? Sure. I am Nicole Calloway Rankins. I'm a board certified OBGYN. I have been in practice for almost 15 years. I cannot believe that. (laughs) And uh, I work as an OB hospitalist, meaning I work only in the hospital. I do like shift work where I work 24 hour shifts at a time and have the privilege of caring for whoever comes during my shift. And I also have a podcast and an online childbirth education class. And I identify as she, her. And tell everybody what the name of your podcast is. Oh, yes. It's called All About Pregnancy and Birth. Excellent. Yeah. It's a wonderful podcast. I love Thank it you. as well. And that laborist model or hospitalist model is a very mm-hmm. unique one. And mm-hmm. so basically people don't decide you're going to be their OB and do the whole care with you. It's more that they have their own group. They have their own doctors, but when they get to the hospital, you are the person, if you're on shift, you're the one that will deliver the baby if they give birth during that time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I meet people just during labor for the first time. Mm -hmm. And how is that experience? I love it. Uh, I absolutely love my job. The birth never gets old or never loses its excitement and thrill. So it does present some challenges in that I have to very quickly establish that trust and rapport and things like that. But I love it. So I wanted us to talk today about the cascade of interventions. And people might have run into that term in their Google search or in the books they're reading. And I really wanted to get deeper into because I think usually it's talked very superficially. So what is the cascade of interventions? I think about it a couple of ways. Like if you want a low intervention birth, essentially it means like starting to intervene. So that can mean things with like Pitocin in particular or breaking your water. Those are the two biggest things that I think will trigger things that start that cascade. And then from Pitocin or breaking your water, often the contractions can get to be more intense. And then because of Pitocin, you are uh, have to be monitored. We have to monitor the baby's heart rate. And if the hospital doesn't have wireless monitoring, if you're just connected to the machine, then that can restrict your mobility. The contractions can potentially be more intense. And then, uh, then it becomes uh, potentially more difficult to manage the contractions than you get an epidural. So you can see I'm adding things, adding things, adding things. And then the epidural can sometimes cause changes in the baby's heart rate or add that with Pitocin. And then you worry that it can potentially increase your risk for a cesarean birth. So yeah, there's a lot that you just listed there because it is, it's like a snowballing effect, right? One thing Mm -hmm. and then possibly the other and the other. Mm -hmm. So let's go through like those, some of those interventions, cascade Uh of interventions that you mentioned and Mm -hmm. kind of break it down a little bit more of what to consider and what they're all about. You talked about the breaking of the waters. Tell me more. Yeah. So the water is eventually going to break it some point, whether it's, you know, it can be all the way up until birth, but at some point the water will break. 
And typically breaking the water artificially, which is called amniotomy, where we, we use a, a hook. And I was um, had a picture of, I was doing some things on my computer and my daughter's like, is that a crochet hook? So people say it looks like a crochet hook. A really <laughs> big one. Yeah. Yes. It's, but it's plastic. It does look yes. like a big crochet yes. hook. Yeah. Yes. So, and we nick a hole in the bag of water and that you know, causes the water to break. So the the risk of that are that it will, it removes the bag of water, which is uh, acts as a protective barrier around the baby. Uh, we all have bacteria in our vaginas and that bacteria can uh, get to the baby potentially. And the water is what protects babies from that. So it will increase the risk of infection after about 24 hours or so, the risk of infection starts to go up. So that's one thing. Number two, it acts as a cushion. So it doesn't, the core doesn't get compressed and things like that during the course of the labor. When the core gets compressed, sometimes the heart rate will drop. Babies typically, in my experience, I feel like they <laughs> sense that, hey, something's going on and I've cut off my blood supply. <laughs> so they roll off their cord or they move around and things get better. But it will potentially cause changes in the baby's heart rate because the water isn't there to act as a cushion. And then the other issue is that if, the water is broken and the baby is too high in the pelvis. If the umbilical cord falls in front of the head, that's a true, true obstetric emergency where you have to run back for a cesarean birth because the cord will get compressed um, very quickly. And then that's um, emergency C-section. So those are the risks. The benefits are that breaking the water is something that will happen at some point anyway. So it's not as though you're doing something that isn't a part of what's going to happen with labor. And it typically will speed up labor or help the contractions be more intense, but you can't have any, you don't have any control over the effect. So you can break water and then it won't start contractions for two hours or three hours or however many hours. There's no way to predict that. So it's an unpredictable in terms of the effect that it will have. Mm -hmm. And that it has those potential risks of that the baby might not be too happy about it, or it mm -hmm. can make contractions yes, more intense. Yes, it can make contractions more intense. Yes, that's the other thing. So we don't break the water unless we're confident that the head is nice and well applied to the cervix and the risk of that umbilical cord prolapse is low because it really is truly like a run to the back uh, C-section. So then another really commonly known first intervention is the induction. Can you tell me more about that one? Sure. So induction is when we try to get the body to go into labor before labor starts on its own, quite simply. And there are various methods of uh, induction, things like Pitocin, uh, prostaglandins, which are another class of medication, Cytotex, Cervidil, uh, Prepidil, Agel, and then what's called mechanical dilators, like a balloon catheter to help open up the cervix which may be considered like less invasive. They're not as medication oriented, but induction is going to be things to help bring labor on its own. And then there's a spectrum of how, um, of what we do and how it works in order to um, bring about labor in terms of like side effects and risk and benefits of each. That's like a whole nother conversation. <laughs> and we'll link on the show notes. I have <laughs> podcast episodes that talk um, about the whole induction process. So yeah, yes. we're not going to get into that here yes. today. Yes. Um, I will say that induction is with the ARRIVE trial. It has, we've swung too far on the pendulum of like recommending almost that everyone gets induced at 39 weeks and that the data from that trial just isn't really there to support that in my opinion. It can be offered, but doesn't need to be recommended. And I feel it's really important that you say that because I have also seen sort of a more cavalier attitude towards inductions, no big deal. Right. When that means gets you into the hospital and gets you monitored and gets you people looking at you and trying to make mm -hmm. sure that things get moving and something mm -hmm. happens way mm -hmm. earlier than you would otherwise. So on balance, when you're in the hospital, we tend to do things or offer things. So <laughs> you're more likely to have things happen when you're in the hospital. Now, a lot of that depends on the hospital and the culture of the hospital. I happen to work at a hospital that's very comfortable with low intervention, but in general, like stay home as long as you can, because once you get to the hospital, there's going to be more temptation for interventions. So then, okay, say you are having an induction or 
for some reason, your labored slow down and there's a need to bring in some Pitocin to augment things. What are some of the risk benefits of Pitocin? Sure. So Pitocin is the synthetic version of the naturally occurring hormone oxytocin that brings on contractions and does other things, but it does contractions. And the benefits are that it will help bring on your labor. So it makes you have contractions. Contractions are what causes your cervix to open and dilate. So that's the benefit. The risk, and particularly when we, we get into the risk, are doing too much Pitocin. So the risk are that it can affect the baby's heart rate and cause changes in the heart rate if there are too many contractions uh, back to back to back. If you're on Pitocin for a really long period of time, sometimes it can increase the risk of postpartum hemorrhage. And when you talk to folks, birthing people that have had birth uh, with and without Pitocin, they almost universally say that Pitocin contractions are stronger. So they will typically be more intense. And I think the way we get into trouble with Pitocin in terms of causing or or precipitating the cascade of interventions, again, is giving too much and not realizing that Pitocin, it doesn't have to stay on. Like you can use the Pitocin until labor starts and then you can turn it back. You can turn it off once the birthing person's own natural labor kicks in for sure. It doesn't work more effectively the more that you give it. You just need to get it to the level that it's working and then either leave it there or turn it back or turn it off. And then just bringing it back a little gives that person that space they need to like get back on top of it and then realize, hey, your body's taking over. And then as you say, yeah, the permission to turn it off. Yes, 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 for sure. Yep. And so that would be one way to, by being vigilant with what's happening with your body and if your process is taking over, that's one way of eliminating or or lessening the chances of going down the cascade of interventions. Nicole, let's talk about continuous monitoring. Yes. Yes. Because truthfully, (laughs) continuous monitoring is not evidence-based for low-risk people. No, and low-risk women, and ACOG says this, this is like a secret, and ACOG is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. It sets standards for maternity care for obstetricians, particularly in the U.S. Um, And low-risk women has not been shown to have um, a lot of benefits. In fact, some harm, some would say. It does reduce, the only thing it reduces is neonatal seizures by like a tiny amount. Otherwise, it increases the risk for cesarean birth, increases the risk for assisted vaginal delivery with vacuum or forceps. So it has not been shown to be beneficial. And you think it would, right? Because you would think that you're monitoring the baby all the time. So you're going to catch anything before it happens. But what happens is that we get concerned about the heart rate, and then that triggers interventions or cesarean birth. Mm -hmm. So we talked about the induction. And if you're having an induction, then most likely you're having continuous monitoring too. So those two go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So then things get more intense, and then you're more likely of wanting some pain relief medicine or an epidural. What are the risks and benefits of it? Sure. I mean, the biggest benefit is that it's extremely effective at reducing pain. So it works, but it's the most effective pain relief. I mean, it, it is when it works. Yep. Yeah, when it works, it works. And it reduces the sensation below a certain level, like it reduces all sensation. The best epidurals, you can't feel the contractions or you feel them and you know that they're there, but they're not terrible. And you still have some movement. So you still have some motion in your legs so you can still feel some sensation so you know where to push. So that's the ideal like sweet spot for an epidural. So some of the risks are that the medication can decrease your blood pressure, which will in turn decrease your baby's heart rate potentially. Now, the fix for that is to get your blood pressure back up and that'll fix the baby's heart rate. But sometimes some obstetricians either don't wait long enough or get concerned and not really addressing the blood pressure. They see the heart rate and run back for a cesarean. That tends to happen within the first half an hour or so after getting an epidural. Oh, and is also why they give you a couple of bags of fluids before getting the epidural to sort of shore up the blood pressure so that your blood pressure doesn't tank. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that, so there's that risk. Epidurals can cause you to have a fever sometimes. We don't always know why that's the case, but it can cause you to have a fever. I think the biggest, and I don't know if this is a risk, but the the fact that if you are 
if you are really, really numb, and you have a hard time focusing when to push and it can make pushing longer. It also takes away your ability to move. So you have to have a nurse who is proactive about moving you in different positions. Those tiny little millimeters of space will make a difference for a baby coming down in the pelvis the right way. When you don't have an epidural, you're going to naturally move and change and, you know, you're lean, you squat, you, um, you know, all of those lunges, all of those things that help move baby down (laughs) into the right position. You don't have that with an epidural. So you have to move, you have to do things like the peanut ball to open your pelvis, make space, get those millimeters. So you don't want to be like just laying in the bed all the time because that doesn't help facilitate the best position for birth. Yeah. And then I find that Usually then you get situations where baby's heartbeat is showing some D cells because they're compressing the cord from being too Mm -hmm. long in one side or they're not moving Mm -hmm. around as much wiggling down the pelvis because you're kind of lying there. And then it starts getting very stressful and there's a lot of anxiety that comes into the room and a lot more interventions. Can we talk about those? Sure. So some things that may happen in order to, to help fix the baby's heart rate are like after the water's broken, whether it's either naturally or artificially, we try to put fluid back. So that's something called an amnio infusion, where we put fluid back into the uterus to help provide a cushion. And that requires something called an intrauterine pressure catheter, where you have to put the fluid through. So you have to put that in. Also other interventions, and this is called intrauterine resuscitation. So intra inside uterine while baby's still inside the uterus, and then to give the baby some help. Position changes, the amnio infusion, also a bolus of IV fluids, sometimes oxygen. Those are the things that we do to try to help improve the baby's heart rate. Yeah. And I find that all that also comes along with what I see happen first before all that is an internal fetal monitor just to get a better handle on baby's heart heart rate. Yeah. Yeah. And that is so, um, yes, that is, I'm glad you said that. So that is something that commonly happens, but it doesn't have to. If you can trace the monitor on the outside effectively using the external monitor, like adding an internal monitor on the baby's scalp doesn't give you any additional information. So it's not necessary unless for some reason you can't use someone on the outside. It's an outdated thinking that the internal monitor gives you better information. It doesn't. On the flip side, some people like the internal because it takes away the belts on the outside, (laughs) which can be uncomfortable. So there are risk and benefits, but it's not strictly necessary or doesn't provide like any better information. And since we're talking about this, let's describe how it's done and what it's about, because I don't think people quite understand that either. Yeah. So the internal fetal heart rate monitor, it's a little electrode that's actually twisted into the baby's scalp. I know that sounds terrible, (laughs) but it's a little tiny wire that gets just put into the baby's scalp and it picks up the baby's heart rate. It's like a little coil. And so if your water hasn't broken at that point, then your water needs to be broken first to be able to attach this to the baby's scalp. In your experience, how often when you've gotten that far along of having an intrauterine pressure catheter uh-huh. and having internal monitoring and having them the amnio infusion, all these things, mm-hmm. oxygen. Mm-hmm. Like in your experience, once you get to that point, how likely is it that a vaginal birth will be possible? Yeah, I think it's actually still pretty likely. It really depends. I mean, a lot of that depends on the provider. And I will also say that most people that ha- that get an epidural or even Pitocin, don't end up with a cesarean and don't necessarily end up, you know, having all of these issues. It does increase the chances, but it's not like a guaranteed slam dunk that if you start Pitocin or that if your water gets broken or that if you get an epidural, that all of a sudden it's going to end in cesarean because actually it's, it's not. A lot of that is, again, dependent on the provider and the hospital and the culture. But I would still confidently say that most of the time it doesn't necessarily end in cesarean. Now, this is this is a little bit tricky for me because I'm speaking from my experience in the hospitals and places where I've worked, which have fortunately been places that give labor a lot of time, but not all places and providers are like that. So it can really vary a lot. 
Uh, so you just have to have a sense and a feel for, I, I say this constantly, how the approach of birth, the way the hospital, the way your doctor approaches birth is going to be hugely influential. Well, which ties beautifully with my next question, which was going to be, are there ways to minimize interventions? And so you and I both agree that who you enlist as your care provider and who is in your birth team, that's a huge important decision that really is going to mm -hmm. determine and guide and affect how your labor and birth experience progresses. Correct. 100%. And the time is not when you get to the hospital to find that information out. You must ask those questions during prenatal care. So if you're interested in a low intervention birth, so asking like, what is your experience? What is the hospital's experience? Um, how do you feel about doulas? Doulas are great in that regard. And so asking those questions ahead of time. So you go into it knowing what you're, what you're working with, so to Definitely. speak. Definitely. And then going along with that is good childbirth education, like wherever it, you know, there are lots of options out there. You have to find what works best for you, but please do childbirth education because it will help you understand the process of labor and the interventions and the things to look for and questions to ask. So childbirth education is really important. And I love that you said um, look into doulas because I've got stats for that. So in terms of continuous support from the website Birth by the Numbers, which is a fantastic website headed by Dr. Jean DeClerc, the latest stats that they have on doulas and how having doula support can lessen the chances of having a cesarean, people that didn't have a doula had 34% chances of having a cesarean, whereas people who did have a doula, that percentage dropped to 9%. Now, the sample was small, but still, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I have a background in, in research and I don't, the things that I say, I always try to look for data. It's, it is slam dunk research proven that continuous support from someone like a doula other than your labor nurse will improve your outcomes in a multitude of ways, uh, reduce the cesarean birth rate. Uh, you're better able to tolerate the discomfort of labor or pain of labor. You'll feel better about your experience. So like tons of evidence to support that. And I know sometimes it can be like a cost barrier or difficult. I always say this is a great thing to put on your baby registry if you can't, you know, or ask people to help support you with, because it's like the benefits and the return on investment is a lot. Nicole, is there anything else that we need to talk about relating to the cascade of interventions? Yeah, I just think in general, we, we all know that birth is an unpredictable process and none of us can predict how it's going to go. The baby runs the show and they don't tell us what they're going to do. <laughs> so the more that you are prepared and empower yourself with information and have that before you go into your birth, the, the better able you'll be to manage those curves if they come. And they may not come, you know, I'm not saying it's going to be that way, but you'll be able to handle the things that will come your way and you will feel more peaceful afterwards if things don't, even if they don't go exactly as you planned, because you've done everything that you can do within your power and you know what to expect and you have some ideas. Because ultimately I see that it is not at the end that people feel that they're happy about their birth because they did it without medication or they, it's not the, the pain relief or anything. It's that they felt, they felt good. They felt respected. They felt empowered going into that experience. And that's how you'll feel good on the other mm -hmm. side. And to feel that birth happened and you were an active participant and you were involved yes. in shared decision making yes, and not that exactly. things were done to you because that's where trauma sets in. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate talking. It's so much fun. Oh, thank you for having me. That was board certified OBGYN and hospitalist, Dr. Nicole Calloway Rankins, who is also the host of the podcast, All About Pregnancy and Birth. You can find her on Instagram at Dr. Nicole Rankins. 
I hope that your main takeaway from our conversation is that although some interventions can be beneficial, you need to understand the risk of any and all interventions and how they may lead to more interventions so you can be informed, prepared, and able to decide whether they make sense for you, your labor, and your baby. One thing you can do for you is to proactively set in place positive interventions during birth and immediate postpartum, such as hiring a doula or including doula services in your baby registry and advocating for as much immediate and abundant skin-to-skin time with your newborn following their birth. The one thing you can do for the rest of us is to follow and support the White Ribbon Alliance. Their global work advances evidence-based perinatal care in alignment with the more conservative guidelines for labor augmentation and induction set down by the World Health Organization. Learn more at whiteribbonalliance.org. You can connect with Birthful on Instagram at Birthful Podcast. And to learn about Birthful in my birth and postpartum preparation classes, go to birthful.com. Birthful was created by me, Adriana Lozada, and is a production of La Antigua Williams & Co. The show's senior producer is Paulina Velasco, Jen Chien is our executive editor, Cedric Wilson is our lead producer, and Kojin Tashiro mixed this episode. Thank you for listening to and sharing Birthful. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, and everywhere you listen. And come back next week for more ways to inform your intuition. Mighty Ones, we want to know more about you, so we've created a survey. Go to birthful.com slash survey, and as a bonus for filling it out, you'll be automatically entered to win a $100 Amex gift card. Tell us what you think at birthful.com slash survey.